Today on Larry King Now, Bones' David Boreatis on Bones' 200th episode. The characters are playing different roles based in 1954. It was a great day of shooting. The great cars, the outfits, the thriller aspect of the knife being hit in the back of the, the guy, you know, killing him. Uh, the banter, the relationship, the love of entering a club scene in the day and how simpler the times were. I mean, it's a really 1954 simpler time. On jobs he had as a struggling actor. You'd get into a car and you'd you'd have this whole sales pitch line and you'd, and you'd walk up to the door and, and basically try to sell them flash frozen lobsters and filet mignons and tell them that it was the best filet mignons and then get them to purchase these At the door. Items. At the door. Plus, superpower you'd love to have. Uh, invisibility. Me too. Oh, what could beat that? Oh, man, you know, hey. Hey. <laughs> Good, great minds think alike, huh? <laughs> Time. We're <laughs> real voyeuristic people, I don't know. <laughs> All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now, fighting a cold but struggling on. Our special guest is David Boreanaz, actor, producer, director. He played the tortured vampire Angel on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and later on the self-titled series Angel. And he's currently starring in his 10th season as FBI Special Agent Seeley Booth on Fox's Bones, airing its 200th episode tomorrow, Thursday, December 11th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And he directed that last episode. Now, based on your career, you're 90 years old. <laughs> well, that, then you're talking cult vampire years, <laughs> so that's a whole other story, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so that's, uh, you know, blessed to uh, have, have gotten into the business somewhat with, you know, with, with Buffy and how that all started with Joss Whedon. I mean, that was a type of a show back in 97 that kind of hit hard and fast and pretty furious. So for me, it was pretty much a big introduction into show business and what it was all about. And you started I, young though, didn't you? I didn't start too young. I mean, I, I moved out here in 1991 with my, my father and I drove out cross country after I graduated from Ithaca College. And uh, for me, it was really sports in high school growing up and I did some school plays and whatnot in, in grade school. But I kind of put the whole uh, acting slash uh, thing in the back because I wanted to play football. I wanted to be a football player in high school, and that didn't turn out too well. But, um, you know, I was obsessed with sports and wanted to be an, an athlete and then uh, got to Ithaca and uh, you know, got into the School of Communications there and then came out to Hollywood that first year. I, in 1987, I fell in love with it and mm -hmm. decided to switch majors to film and television. 200 episodes mm -hmm. of Bones. You direct. You directed others too, right? Yes. You directed yeah. this one. Is this one like a Hitchcock kind of thing? It's got a bit of a, a thriller aspect to it. We They set it in 1954, so we see the characters kind of develop in different roles, uh, not being that she's the forensic anthropologist, uh, played by Emily Deschanel, but she is the wannabe lead detective in the L.A. police force in 1954, and the chief officer is played by Ryan O'Neill. And... I play a jewel thief, which is based on the Cary Grant kind of role in To Catch a Thief. So there's some similarities to it as far as um, what it's kind of about, but going into it, I didn't really want to, as a director, I didn't want to say, I'm doing a Hitchcockian piece. I'm doing Hitchcockian shots. I, I watched, I loved Hitchcock, Hitchcock. I loved his films, but I didn't say, I'm doing Hitchcock style. Why do you like directing? I like it because I like to listen. I love the uh, the interest aspect of it. I love working with actors. Um, I love sitting down and watching the process, being an actor and understanding what it takes just to show up on set and, and kind of be prepared. Um, I love that the process of it, and I love framing. I love shots. Um, I love the movement of the camera, but I love to do it inside the confines of what the actor's bringing, portraying. Is Bones technically correct when it discusses bones in the body and crime? Very much so. Yeah, they're, they're very particular. Now, that, that whole part of the show is run by a whole other department. They take oh, on really? the whole, they have the writer's room, and then the writer's room kind of heads it over to the department of people who are very particular with the bones and the, the parts and, and how that whole operates. Thank God I play the FBI guy because I wouldn't <laughs> do well with that. Emily does a great job. She has, for so many seasons, tackled that uh, that verbiage the and that language. It's very technical, and I some of the dialogue that comes out of her mouth just amazes me. I just I'm just the sarcastic cop with an attitude.
we basically solve the crimes off of the, the body. We find the, go to the crime scene, get the body back to the lab. They clean it out, and they have their the forensic tech people that are all there are specialized in figuring out how or in with inside the bones how something could have happened, which leads. Why to is the show a hit? When I read the pilot um, at the time, um, the first time I read it, 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 it sounded to me like a romancing the stone type of a piece, that film. Um, very character driven, very character heavy. It was more about the relationship and how these two kind of guided their way through dealing with each other, finding the body, and then solving the crime. And ultimately. And then getting married. And then getting married eventually. And that whole led to the whole chemistry and the whole will they, won't they aspect into the whole as the series progressed. Emily and I worked with a renowned acting coach out here, Ivana Chubbuck, who is, uh, has worked with many people out here. And she, every weekend we would go and we would work the scenes, we'd rewrite the scenes, and we would bring it to the writers. And they would, they would accommodate the, the interest that we had and, and the ideas that we had. So Harder than being a vampire? You know what? That <laughs> being a vampire at the time with, with Joss and Buffy and Angel was a whole different type of experience. I mean, that was like working... On, in front of green screens and wire work and, and special effects makeup. But we would shoot that show in eight days. And uh, I remember George Lucas came to our set to visit because his kid was a big fan of, of Buffy and Angel. And he came to see us at Paramount one day. And he, I was talking to him. And he says, amazed how you guys shoot these series and these shows. They're like mini movies. Because we would shoot them with all special effects and stunt work all in two days. I mean, wow. television's a different animal. So. Let's watch a clip from uh, Thursday's episode of Bones. No one will ever suspect you're hiding out of my place. The couch is very comfortable. Right. So you never let anyone in your bedroom before. Must be cold in there. Men have been slapped for less. And more. You still haven't told me about Sarge. The bedroom now. Oh, miss. Oh. <laughs> What was that about? <laughs> well, that was, a, you know, that obviously that's at her apartment in Hollywood in 1954. Um, the art direction is just fantastic in this episode. But um, basically what was happening, I'm being framed for a murder. I play the jewel thief, and I'm in her house, apartment for the first time. And uh, well, while trying to discover who did this, uh, one of her cohort workers show up, and I have to go upstairs and hide. And at the end, we find out we have to go to the, uh, the Velvet Club in order to get the real person who might be of interest to this killer. So... It's a whole beginning of a, of a scene that started innocently and had that banter. And it's done. a Bones episode. Yes, Bones so episode. the FBI agent was once a jewel thief? It's not that he was once a jewel thief. I think what we, we're seeing is the characters are playing different roles based in 1954. Okay. And, and for Booth, it's, he's playing a jewel thief, but he, he has this kind of connection to how authority works at, by the end of the episode, and he finds himself... Later on in the years, you know, now cut to Bones present day, he's a real cop. So there's that resemblance. It's not necessarily like he's a jewel thief. What kind of odd jobs did David have when he first came out to Hollywood? We'll find out when we get back. The 200th episode of Bones will air Thursday. That's tomorrow night on uh, Fox at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern. You came out here cold. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. What kind of jobs did you have? Uh, anything you that a I waiter? could really. No, I never got into the the, the restaurant waiting thing. I, I, my philosophy was if I want to be around and get involved in work and show business and be an actor, I had to be on a set. So, I took the odd PA jobs and worked on a film called Best of the Best Two when Eric Roberts was on it and um, you know, Chris Penn was on it and some. Uh, so for me, it was like working in props, and then as a PA person, and going out and getting coffee, and then getting, being there, being there, being around the actors and seeing them work. And I, I remember doing. Eric was doing a scene, and I was under the table as the prop master, trying to make sure that the the chair didn't fall over when he got up. You know, seeing it <laughs> an actual show or, or film being good produced. training. Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. Being there, being there, and and watching it and, and seeing it on, on, unfold was a it was a it was a great thing to be around. Um, you know, I had the painting. I used to paint houses. I think I painted houses. I, I I sold gourmet food door to door, which didn't work out too well. I think that lasted two days. You'd you'd, <laughs> you'd get into a car and you'd you'd have this whole sales pitch line, and you'd, and you'd walk up to the door and and basically try to sell them 
flash frozen lobsters and filet mignons and tell them that it was the best filet mignons and then get them to purchase these at the door items. at the door and this was back in 1991 so I, I got into the van after I got did the sales training with, a, with the other person I was with and uh, we went I said well we should just go to Beverly Hills I mean they they'll buy steaks and lobster and whatnot so we got out there and we finally got one woman to come out, and it was this lavish, huge mansion. It was like Sunset Boulevard, and our truck was parked outside. We had to sell her through the intercom, so she came out, and she said, oh, that sounds pretty interesting. So we went back to the van, and we had locked the key into the back of the refrigerator truck, so we couldn't get her the, the goods. So <laughs> that was, it didn't work out too well for me on that aspect. Like, what was your first acting job? Uh, for me, I was married with children. That was the first one that I got. And, uh, you know, they were such a great group of people over there. The show had been running for some time. And uh, I played uh, Kelly's biker boyfriend at the time. And it was, uh, for me, it was extremely nerve wracking. But I, I, I remember landing my first agent. And it was, uh, I think, the second audition I went in on. And, and I remember studying this the lines and the scenes all weekend long just to get this part and I was so obsessed with it and I finally went in and I nailed it after the callback and I almost blew it because I remember doing it and I said god I'm gonna blow this you know and finally got through the scene without shaking the paper <laughs> you know you have the sides because actors go and it's very you're in a room and you have all these people looking at you and you know you don't have your sides or don't have your sides and some when you start to see the this or the shake, you don't know your lines. It's it's pretty aggressive. And back then, I was very green. I didn't know much, and but I was able to get it, and uh, it was it was a great experience for me. Big break was Buffy the Vampire Slayer, yeah. uh, Slayer and later the Angel. Mm -hmm. How did you get those parts? At the time, I was uh, I was doing a lot of theater, and I was doing commercials to make ends meet, and it was like kind of my move over into the acting world and saying, all right, I'm now kind of technique-wise studying the craft and figuring out how to do it, just technique-wise. Um, and I was getting the odd jobs, and I was out walking my dog, and my manager, who's still my manager, saw me. It's kind of like a Schwab drugstore kind of a thing. And we went ahead and meeting, and he said, I know this role that's open, and Marsha Shulman is casting it over at Fox. So I went in, met with her, and I think they were on the 12th hour with casting this role. Uh, so I read the, the, the breakdown. It was someone like Joe Lewis, who's a fighter who would always get up and even was knocked down, but he's a vampire. He's 245 years old. I said, I don't you know, whatever. It sounds good to me. <laughs> so I went in, did the role, and uh, I met with Marcia, and we talked about New York restaurants for about 30 minutes and uh, why the food's so much better out there and it's horrible out here. And then she's like, oh, we should probably read for this, right? So I did. I did the read, and then I went in the, that day and read for the producers and got the role, and I was shooting a day later, because it was such a quick turnaround. And there I was in this velvet suit, not knowing a thing to do what I was doing. Do you think Buffy and, and Angel helped spurn all these supernatural shows? In a way, it did, yeah. I think that, you know, if you look back at those shows, and, uh, I mean, Joss uh, created his own world and created this whole kind of uh, place where he wasn't afraid to push the envelope with the with the network in the studio. He's somebody who kind of, uh, he walked to the beat of his own drum and said, this is what I'm going to do. And he did it. And uh, I mean, even, even with revisions, he still stayed true to what he wanted the characters to be like. So you made a career out of one hour dramas, right? Yes. And yeah. playing the same role for a long time. You know, I, f with Buffy and Angel, yeah, and I was blessed to come over to, to, to Bones and find this character that uh, I love doing for an hour on our 200th episode and 10 seasons. Uh, and a relationship to me was always about the material and the character work. So. People say, you've been doing this role for 10 seasons, why don't you get bored doing that? And I said, well, the writing is so ingenious and we're able to kind of move the characters and relate to them in a way that's different for everyday television, and not just watching it and taking it for granted or throwing it out. It's relationship -driven. You never get bored with it. I can't get bored because I'm either I'm producing or directing or, uh, you know, uh, we're pushing the envelope with the scenes and, and for me it's moment to moment. So, no, I've, you know, hey, I've, I've done odd films in between, uh, you know, on hiatuses, but nothing that's really kind of popped. But you just don't have time when you're in television. You're just constantly working. We'll chat about uh, Hibbs growing up in Philadelphia and David's love of the Flyers he used to kill my capitals right after this. <laughs> We're back with David Boreanaz. How do I pronounce it right? Boreanaz. Boreanaz. You got it. Yeah. It's Italian? It's Italian. It's not Greek. <laughs> Why didn't you change it, by the way? Uh, it was funny enough, my first agent, um, 
who I signed on with, it was a small age, boutique agency, and uh, I thought, I, my way to get into an agency at the time was to call up and say to them that you guys left a, a voice message on my machine saying that you wanted to see me because I dropped off my headshot. Because back then they had voice message machines, right? Yeah. And they're like, oh, okay, well they don't remember. <laughs> All right, let me see, I'll get you in here. I don't remember doing that, but that's how I got in the door. So I did it to two of them, and one of them I went in, and I remember sitting there, and it was not really the more adult-oriented place. It ended up being a kid's agency. <laughs> so I went and sat with the girls, like, I don't know what you're really doing here because this is a kid agency. But the second one got there and um, signed on with them. I ended up doing a scene for them. I had to go in, in the room and do a scene. But it worked out I got the agency. And at the time they said, well, you know, would you think about changing your name? I said, I would never do that. So... And then they thought about it, like, no, it's, you're right, we shouldn't change the name. So I kept Boreanaz. You're a Philly freak. Now, Philly yeah. freaks, you're, you're Flyers, is it Flyers, Phillies, 76ers, Eagles? You know, when I moved to Philadelphia with, uh, when I was eight or nine, I was able to, I, was, I got to Philly when all the teams were really winning. The Flyers were hot, the Sixers were hot, the Phillies were hot. They were with Pete Rose, Greg Luzinski, you know, Gary Maddox, Steve Carlton. That whole Phillies team, that A's team was remarkable. It was amazing. Larry Boa, I mean, I can name them up and down. Mike Schmidt in the series that I saw the World Series win, and then the Eagles they had. You know, Wilbert Montgomery, you know, Ron Jaworski. You know, I was like going in as a kid, like, this is great. The Flyers were playing the Islanders, and it was they were hot with Bobby Clark and Bill Barber and it was just a time to be there. So um, for now, I, I'm a big hockey fan. I do a lot of work with the NHL, and uh, I work with Ed Snyder and his foundation and uh, with youth kids, and I love hockey, so Flyers are my team. We're going to show you a clip about athletes talking about playing the city of Philadelphia. Watch. Now we play a little game of If You Only Knew, just out of nowhere. City with the toughest fans. Philadelphia. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> For sure. Philly. City with the most brutal fans. Um, hmm, I'm going to have to go with um, Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> they booed Santa Claus. Right? Oh, that's, that's bad. <laughs> toughest city to play in. Well, in the toughest city, Philly. Philly. <laughs> I guess everybody would say that. They would boo a cure for cancer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're tough. Oh, yeah. Utah's pretty tough, too. The fans are very loud, right? They're loud, but Philly's, like, in your face. They <laughs> really want you to lose. All right, why, <laughs> why Philly? Why are they that way? You know, I think it's just this whole uh, salt-of-the-earth, blue-collar city that's got just this... They're so passionate about their teams. I mean, I remember going to the Spectrum when I first arrived from Buffalo with my father, and we sat in the 700th level of the Spectrum, and that that's like... That's high heat up there. And I was a big Sabres fan. The Sabres came on the ice, and I cheered. You know, the Sabres, Buffalo Sabres. Well, everybody was looking at me like they were going to throw me off the 700th level. <laughs> My dad was there and said, hey, guys, you know, we just moved from Buffalo. And as the game progressed, by the end of the game, I became a Flyers fan pretty fast. Um, <laughs> I think it's the, it's the heart aspect to it. I was talking to someone recently, a couple days ago, the Flyers and their organization, and we talked about heart in the player and how hard it is to play in the city, but the type of player you have to be in order to win in that city and the hard work it takes. And those are the types of players that some of these GMs are looking for, whatever organization is that runs in Philadelphia. And I think that's what it's about. It's a love of the city, love of the people. They just have that passion. They can get a little aggressive at times. They have at the vet. And, uh, yeah, they booed Santa Claus. I think they did that. Threw snowballs at him. They did, didn't they? Yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> well, I did some pretty bad things in, in the metal line. Which Dick too. Allen said they should, they would boo a cure for cancer. That's horrible. <laughs> That's just not. Do you follow them living out here? I do, yeah. I, I follow them. I, you know, when the season's going on, I got the NHL live on the phone in between scenes. When I direct it there in the playoffs, I got the one monitor going. <laughs> you know, hey, I, any clue about what happens tomorrow night? I will say that it's a thrill ride. I will say that it's a, it's a unique and special episode that I'm really proud of because we sh it's a period piece, obviously, and, but it, we shot with an old DC-3 McDonald out in um, Aqua Dolce Airport. It was a great day of shooting. The great cars, the outfits, the thriller aspect of the knife being hit in the back of the, the guy, you know, killing him, uh, the banter, the relationship, the love of entering a club scene in the day and how simpler the times were. I mean, it's a really 1954 simpler time. David will answer your social media questions. We'll play a game of If You Only Knew when we get back. Back with David Boreanaz. Don't forget, tomorrow night, 
the 200th episode of Bones, and he directs it and stars in it. All right, we have some social media questions for you. Lucy Hokobova on Instagram. What's your favorite moment in the 200th episode? Oh, wow, there's a lot of them. But I would have to say the um, that when we... Uh, Enter the club for the first time. Emily and I come down this staircase and we kind of see the whole area. It was a fun episode to play, a fun scene to play. Uh, a, because a, a, Emily is just, is just has the right look for this period piece. She looks great. She looked fantastic. But it was fun coming down and make that entrance. But I also have to say that the, the stuff we did with the DC3 was pretty remarkable. At uh, Pepper Nights, what's the most challenging thing about acting versus directing? Wow. Well, you know, directing you're in control. Directing right? you're in control and being able to maintain a sense of civility <laughs> across the board and uh, acting. There's a lot of waiting. You know, there's a lot of downtime. Um, how you fill that is is up to you. But for directing, you're constantly going. I mean, you're de you're con there's not one thing that you're not. Doing. Is it is it hard working with your friends one week and directing them the next? It's it's difficult and challenging in a way that they you know, I, you know working with this cast is great and when you step on the set you kind of challenge them and push them in a way that is different from what they've been doing for ten seasons or what they have been trying to get stuck into. I think one of the challenges with television, if you're on a show for so long, is you want to be able to change in a way that's challenging to yourself and not make it boring. At Pepper Nice also tweets, why did the 200th episode take 12 days to shoot? Uh, actually, it took 13, almost 14 days to shoot. Uh, a lot of sets, a lot of locations, and uh, availability on time with the house and uh, where we could shoot this one mansion sequence in the opening, um, the different types of cars, the clubs. All of it shot here. Yeah, all of it shot here. At Hellier Booth, do you have a dream guest star you'd like to work with on Bones, and what's it like working with Cindy Lauper? Oh, wow. You know, our guest spot people that come in are, are, are also great. Um, wow. I'd like to work with William Defoe on Bones, but I don't think he would do that. But it would be my dream guest. And I like him as a far lot. as I love him a lot. And Cindy's a great person. I love working with Cindy. She's a, a lot of energy. She's a Ranger fan, so we have fun. <laughs> That's a big rivalry. That's a huge rivalry. Yeah. At Bonehead 447, had, had Booth not been a jewel thief in the 200th episode, what other job would you have liked he had? Oh, maybe a sommelier would have been nice. Sure. <laughs> At Jenny Lee and Bones, who laughs the most on set? Oh, who laughs the most on set? Um, I, I, I would say I'm pretty much a big, big laugher on set, a big prankster. That would be me. I'm the guy who's kind of like the kid in the candy shop, kind of playing practical jokes and, and whatnot and making sure everyone's loose on the set, yeah. All right, now a game if you only knew. I just throw questions Okay. At you. First girl you kissed. Oh, first girl that I kissed. Rachel Riggio. Rachel Riggio, Italian, Catholic, Philadelphia. No, Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, oh, yeah. before you were in. That's right, there you go. Where was it, at school? Uh, it was at my parents' house. You find out whatever happened to her. She's a school teacher in Atlanta, yeah. Wow, you stay yeah. close. Oh, my parents are very close with their family. Yeah. Superpower you'd love to have? Uh, invisibility. Me too. Oh, what could beat that? Oh, man, you know, hey. Hey. <laughs> Good, great minds think alike, huh? Hey, Time. Kind of we're real voyeuristic <laughs> people, I don't know. <laughs> Time period you'd like to go back to and visit? Well, did it in this episode. I love the 50s, 54, fantastic time. I love it. I think times were simpler and easier. There's not a lot of gadgets and people. Eisenhower years. Yeah. Biggest prankster on set? Me. Rolling Stones or Led Zeppelin? Led Zeppelin. Profession you'd like to try for a day? Uh, farmer. Really? Mm -hmm. Would you rather shoot a game-winning goal or block a game-winning shot? Uh, shoot a goal. Slap shot or young blood? Oh, slap shot. Paul yeah. Newman. Paul Newman. I mean, you can't go wrong with that. That's a great film. Favorite flyer of all time? <sighs> Tough one. Ron Hextall with Bobby Clark is right there. Hidden talent. Hidden talent. Oh, interesting. <laughs> well, come on, what is it? Juggler. You juggle? Yeah. Pet peeve. Yeah, uh, small talk. Something your fans would be surprised to know about you. So, I use an electric toothbrush. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why not? Favorite movie hero. 
Uh, favorite movie hero? Um, hmm. It's a tough one. Um, wow. Favorite movie hero? Oh, I love Harrison Ford. Um, you know, that's somebody I really grew up with. I mean, just when I was younger. Great guy, the, too. Great, yeah, fantastic guy, yeah. Biggest similarity you have to Booth? Socks. <laughs> Music on your iPod? Music on my iPod. Uh, a lot of Led Zeppelin. A lot of old classic rock. Another TV show you'd love to direct or cameo in? Hmm. Interesting. Um, another TV show. Maybe uh, not too many. Anything on BBC. I you love like the, I Yeah, like I do. I kind of I, I steer more towards the, the BBC a love of television these days. I think the television out here is a little crazy. And what's a perfect day when you're not working? You know, chilling at home, being with the kids, you know, making breakfast. David, great having you with Pleasure. us. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Really enjoy. I want to thank my guest, David Morianis, and make sure to watch the 200th episode of Bones, directed by David, tomorrow night, Thursday, December 11th at 8 p.m. on Fox. You can find me on Twitter at King's Things. Apologize for the cold. See you next time.